Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hey, can we give a bigger shout for Jesus this morning? Listen, you need to understand something. I'm okay, Jesus is better. Does anybody agree with me? Well, hey, I'm ready to get started. So why don't you go ahead and turn your neighbor, give a high five, go ahead and have a seat across all of our locations. And it is my honor to be with you today. As Pastor Aaron said, my name is Ryan, and uh, alongside my wife, Kirsten, we have the honor of leading the North Tampa location here at Radiant Church. And we're so excited to be here today at South Tampa, but I do want to welcome all of our locations who are joining in with us right now. So we have our our St. Pete location, Clearwater, Brandon Heights. I know they're going wild up there in North Tampa right now. South Tampa, you look good online. Can we welcome all those people who are joining us today? And I know we already did this in all of our services, but I think it is important for, to make a special group of people feel loved and welcome today. And that's our first time guest. So across all of our locations, one more time, can we get it for those people who are spending their very first Sunday with us? Hey, if it's your first time with us, we're so glad that you are here. And like Pastor Aaron said, if you are church shopping, the shopping is done. You have found a church home and we're so glad that you are here today. And I do want to be able to give honor where honor is due because as Pastor Aaron said, I've been at Radiant for a long time. I came that, that first Easter at Radiant. I've been on staff for a long time. And you know, I, I never want to take for granted the amazing leader that we have in Pastor Aaron. Can we just give it up for Pastor Aaron? I know him and the team are joining us right now online from Sri Lanka. And I just want you to know that the person you see on the stage is the person that is off this stage. And I'm glad to just be a part of the church, let alone a pastor at a church where we have such incredible leadership like Pastor Aaron. And so thank you, Pastor Aaron, for all that you do. We're so grateful for you. But I do, before I get into the message today, I I do want to address something when it comes to Pastor Aaron. And he's one of my closest friends. He's my pastor. But but I do need to uh, address something because you know, a year and a half ago, when I married Kirsten, my life changed forever. Actually, I have a picture of my family here for you, and that's Kirsten and I, when we got married last year, and uh, there's my, uh, my family. I have a 15-year-old son named Bo, and uh, he's taller than me, um, which is not hard to do, I guess, but, um, but I, still have, I beat him up regularly, just so he knows who's in charge still, but he's awesome. Then my 13-year-old daughter, Carmen, and then Seth actually turns six tomorrow. So uh, we're taking him to Disney tomorrow, and he's going to just lose his mind in the morning when we take him there. So we're super excited about that. But, you know, when Kirsten and I got married uh, last year, uh, I came into the marriage as a dad. But Kirsten made me, uh, when we got married, she made me a cat dad. And um, whenever uh, somebody said, ew, uh, first of all, (laughs) and that's what we're addressing this morning, because... I sit here like many of you do. I sit at North Tampa every week and I hear the jokes about cats and how bad cats are and stuff like that. And I, I sit there and I listen to this and I knew that one day I'd have the opportunity to stand before all of you and share with you a photo that I've been sitting on for two and a half years <laughs> because I want to unveil the truth to you today about your beloved, my beloved pastor, Pastor Aaron Book. It's this. He loves cats. Uh, look, at, look at that face. Is that a face of somebody who hates cats? I think not. Pastor Aaron, it, cats out of the bag, pun intended. Pastor Aaron likes cats. So uh, I feel better about moving on with the service today now that we've been able to do that. I also am fearful because we've been friends for a long time and I'm afraid of what pictures he'll put up of me one day. But, but I needed to address that before we went any further um, so we can get into it now. Uh, hey, before we actually get into our scripture for today, I wanted to do something because uh, if you know me, I am a big icebreaker question fan. Uh, I, I love doing it. I, I was a CrossFit coach for several years, and so we did it there. I ran Next Steps here at the church for a long time. We always do icebreaker questions there. And, and even if we're out to dinner with friends, I like to ask questions like this because it, does, it breaks the ice, gets us a little more comfortable before we move into whatever else we're about to do. So I, I want to do something that I've never done before. I want to do the largest icebreaker question I've ever done. So across all of our locations, online, right here in the room in South Tampa, I need you guys' help participating in this question. And here's where this question comes from. Um, A couple of years ago, a friend of ours started to get really popular on social media. And and as they became more and more popular, we started to see that they were getting sponsored by these different companies. And as they got sponsored by these companies, they would get free stuff sent to them and they would post these videos on their social media about these companies that were sending stuff to them. And it started making me think, if I could get sponsored by any company and I'm getting free stuff, I'm talking about them on social media, 
Who would I want to get sponsored by? So I want you to go ahead and think of it right now across all of our locations. If you could be sponsored by one company, you're getting free stuff for them. You're their ambassador. You're their rep. Who would you want to get sponsored by? So I'm going to count to three. And across all of our locations, online, put it in the chat. North Tampa, I need you to yell it real loud here. South Tampa, I want to hear it. If you could be sponsored by one company, who would you want to be sponsored by? I didn't count to three yet. Um, <laughs> all right, here we go. Ready? One, two, three. Who do you got? Apple. What? Apple? Apple? She, Apple! That's, all right, I got it. No, you're good. I, I get it. Uh, Somebody in, a, in an earlier service said Dunkin' Donuts. I said, you know what? I, I don't, sure. Uh, if that's what you want, I guess. But it's disgusting. Well, dealer's choice, I guess. Um, but you know, it, this is a hard question for me to answer because if I had to pick one, I'm a brand loyal guy. If you guys follow me on social media, and if you don't, at RyanJ49, follow me right now. I mean, but that's not why we're here. Um, if you follow me, you know that I'm a brand loyal guy. I post about things that I like a lot. I tag them in my stories. Um, and so I, I have no problem talking to people. Like, I love, I just mentioned it earlier, and this is the second time in the sermon, I love CrossFit. Um, I think it changed life. I've done it for over 10 years. I may have gotten in a conversation with you at the church before about CrossFit. You didn't bring it up, I did probably. <laughs> But we've talked about it, and I, I love CrossFit. And even actually, you know, over the last couple of months, I've actually gotten really big into Peloton. I ride my Peloton bike five or six days a week. I love it, I think it's awesome. I tell everybody I can about it, because I, I like it, it's, it's done awesome things for me. Uh, you know, probably the thing I get asked about the most by people who follow me on social media is about my Traeger grill. I love my Traeger pellet smoker, and I cook on there all the time. And um, I, I, you know, I love putting different meats on there. And, and people ask me about it all the time. And I have sold several people at Radiant on buying Traegers because I love them. And I tag Traeger in all my stories. And I always go b back to see if they responded or if they even saw it. And they haven't. Um, <laughs> But I believe that one day they will. And Traeger, if you're watching, and I know that you are, I'm ready for this deal to happen. But, but I love them. I post about them all the time. And, and to put me on the Traeger, I go to my favorite place in all of Tampa, which is the Heights Meat Market. And I go there. I get all the different cuts of meat I do. And those guys love me there. Those guys respond to my story all the time. They have given me free stuff in the past. We have this like unofficial partnership, but I'm ready to take this thing official. Like If you guys just want to keep giving me more free things, I'm there for it. Let's just tell me where to sign. But I, I love the Heights Meat Market. You know, to wash all this barbecue down, I go to my favorite coffee spot in all of Tampa at King State. I think they have the best cold brew in all of Tampa. You probably have seen me hanging out there before because I love King State. I'll post about them when I'm there. You know, I love these different things. I, I wear built t-shirts and, and when I travel, I, I fly Delta or I fly Emirates. You know, I, I love these different things and, and I'll post about them. I, I do all that kind of stuff. But you know, here's the thing is these are people that I'd want to be sponsored by and be an ambassador for. But when you think about it, we have the best brand out there as Christians. Like we have the ability to be able to represent Jesus who died on the cross for us. What an incredible thing. You know, actually, the Bible, when we talk about like, who would we want to get sponsored by? The Bible already says, guess what? We are ambassadors for Christ. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5. It says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was trying to make his appeal through us. So we implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. You see, like I said, I'm a brand loyal guy. I have no problem talking your ear off for hours at, at in about my Traeger. And you probably have the things and the places that you've been that you love and you'll talk about. But how much easier is it for us to talk about those things that really don't matter than it is to talk to people about Jesus? You see, week one of this series in Romans, we've been doing these I am statements every week. And week one of this series was I am unashamed of the gospel. And I think that's true for a lot of us on Sunday mornings. I think we can stand here and we can, be, we can be so thankful for what God has done for us that we can have our hands raised in worship and then we go to work on Monday morning and people say, what'd you do this weekend? And we say, nothing. And we have an opportunity in that moment to be ambassadors for Jesus, but we, we don't. So how do we do this? How, how do we become ambassadors? How do we let people know about the, this, the greatest brand that's out there today? Well, we're going to see our answer today as we continue in the book of Romans. Today we're going to be in Romans 10. So if you have your Bible with you, you can go ahead and turn to Romans 10. You can pull out your notes. It's going to be on the screen behind me as well. But today we're going to look at Romans chapter 10. And our key verses today that we're going to focus in on comes from verses 13 through 15. And let's look at it together. It says, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. 
How then can they call on the name that they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how can anyone preach without being sent? Because as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. You see, we are to be ambassadors for Christ. And we see it's a beautiful thing to bring the good news of Jesus to others. And so what I want us to answer today is how do we do that? And I think here in Romans 10, Paul gives us an amazing outline of how we do this. And, you know, we're going to continue with our I am statements this week. And I think that the I am statement today is going to help us leave here differently, understanding how do we do this. And so you can write it in your notes. The title of today's message is I am living on mission. I am living on mission. You see, about two months ago, Pastor Aaron wrote me and asked me if I'd want to preach today. And I immediately texted back, yes, for sure. Um, I didn't know the verse. I didn't know the context. He said, do you want to preach? I said, yeah, I'm in. Uh, And then he wrote me back and said, all right, you're going to be doing Romans 10 and here's your verses. And I said, this is great. You know, because for the last couple of years at the church, I've overseen missions. uh, And so, you know, this is one of the key verses that we use when we talk about missions with other people. We use Romans 10, 13 through 15. And um, so I was like, he wants me to do a missions talk. I can do that in my sleep. So I'm really excited now. And then his next message said, don't make it about missions. And I said, okay, uh, that doesn't make sense because this is the verse that we use when we talk about missionaries. And we understand that there's a huge need around the world. There's still 42% of the world that does not have access to the gospel. That doesn't mean that they haven't accepted Jesus yet. They haven't. But it means that they don't have a church or a Christian or even a Bible in their own language. They don't have access to the gospel. So we look at these verses and we say, well, how are they going to hear unless someone preaches? And how is someone going to preach unless they are sent? And this is the call for people to go out and do missions and reach people around the world. But I think the thing that's interesting, if we look at Romans 10 and we go back to verse 1, we'll see the actual intent of Paul when he wrote this to the Romans here. Because look what he says in Romans 10.1. He says, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God is for the Israelites that they may be saved. You see, here Paul wasn't calling them to go to distant lands and reach people. He's saying, no, I want to see my people. I want to see the people of my country be saved. And I don't know about you, I think G- America needs Jesus. If you're... But, you know, I-, I have a heart for missions. And-, and-, and we do as a church. And that's why Pastor Aaron and the team are over there checking on our programs right now. And we're going to continue to send funds and support missionaries and send out missionaries from Radiant. We're going to send out short-term missions teams. If you you haven't never been on a mission trip, go. It's life-changing. And you can go on one of the trips we have next year. But I also understand the fact that sometimes it's easier to go on a short-term missions trip and go around the world. I was just back in Nicaragua back in August. It's easier to go on a short-term missions trip and tell people that Jesus loved them than it is to go across the street and talk to people that we see every single day. You see, and and we we do this because we think, well, we live in a Christian country. Like the United States is Christian, so we need to go to these other countries who, who obviously need God more than we do. And what we do is we look around and we see churches like Radiant, and we think we're doing great as a country. You know, I actually heard last year at a missions conference this statistic that for every McDonald's that you pass, it represents 27 Christian churches in America. Think about that. On my drive from Land Lakes down here to South Tampa this morning, I passed no less than five McDonald's. It's not that I was counting. It's not that I was hungry. It's not that I stopped and got a McGriddle. It has nothing to do with any of that stuff. But I was paying attention because I knew this. So you know what that means? I passed five McDonald's on the way here today. That represents 135 churches that we have in America. And we see this and we think we're doing just fine, right? And sometimes things can look really healthy on the surface. But when you dig a little bit deeper, you see that there's things that are unhealthy. See, the Pew Research Center did a study and it showed that as, uh, as early as the 1990s, the, the, about 90% of U.S. adults identified as Christian. We were a majority Christian country. In 2007, that number went down from 90 to 78%. And now in 2022, the number has dropped to 64%. From 2007 until now, the, the people who identify as religious nuns or religiously unaffiliated has grown from 16 to 29%. These are alarming stats. The Pew Research Center said that if nothing changes within the next two decades, the United States will be less than 50% Christian. We are on our way to becoming a non-Christian country. 
But that's the United States. Let's actually take a look right here at home, right in the Tampa Bay area. Based on the last census, it said that only 34.7% of Tampa Bay residents identified as regular churchgoers. Now let's put that into perspective. Las Vegas, which is known as Sin City, has a higher percentage of regular churchgoers than Tampa Bay. Out of the 51 metro areas with at least a million residents, Tampa Bay places 50th out of 51. Only Portland, Oregon has less regular churchgoers than we do. I don't know about you, but these statistics break my heart. And I don't know about you, but I am unwilling to accept these numbers. I'm unwilling to say, to accept what the Pew Research Center said, that if nothing changes, that will become less. You know, we can change it. If we're living on mission as Christians, we can see lives change. We can see statistics change. We can see people saved. We can see marriages restored. We can see people be freed from the confusion that the world is feeding to them. But it takes us living on mission. Mission. So I want, to, I want you to leave here today feel equipped for how you can live on mission. And we're actually going to go through the verses that we, we looked at to see some steps that we can take to live on mission. And we're actually going to work our way backwards in the list that Paul gave us. So we're going to start in Romans 10, 15, when it says, How can anyone preach unless they are sent? Because as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. So how do we live on mission? Well, the first thing that we need to start with is a proper understanding. You can write it in your notes there. Number one is that I am called. I am called. And we can read these words from Paul and we can think, okay, uh, some people are meant to be sent, but not me. Like, like I, I'm not called to go and reach people for Jesus and, and do these different things. And, and what we do is we think that the calling that, that pastors and church staff members have is different from the calling that you have. But I want you to know our calling is the same. All of us have been called by Jesus to go and make disciples. We see it in Matthew 28. It's known as the, the Great Commission, one of the most famous passages in the New Testament that we read in Matthew 28, where Jesus said this, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and, do, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, I love what Jesus does here. Before he gives them the command of what to do, he qualifies the authority with which he has to give the command to them. He says, I have been given all authority on heaven and on earth. So guess what? You should probably pay attention to what I'm about to say. You know, it reminds me of, of my time in the military. I, I was spent 15 years in the Air Force. And one more time, can we get up for our veterans across all of our location? We can't honor you enough for the sacrifice that you've made so we can enjoy the freedoms that we have here today. But in my time in the military, I, I understood something, that when somebody was higher ranking than me, I knew that they were there, if they were an officer, that they had the, the authority to be able to give me commands, right? So if they said, hey, we need you to go do this, or if the Air Force said, hey, we need you to go move here or do this, guess what? I had to follow that, that command. But here Jesus says, I've been giving all authority in heaven and on earth. And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. We read this and we think, okay, Jesus says all nations, but that clearly means all nations except for us, right? No, no, no. He says we're making disciples of all nations. And when Jesus says this here and when he says go, does he say, hey, hey, pastors, go and make disciples of all nations? Or, hey, people with a special calling from God, go and make disciples. Or, hey, listen, if you have that special, like, tingling in your spine, you're the one who should go and make disciples of all nations. No, no, no. Jesus doesn't give any qualifications. He says, now all of you, if I have the authority to give this command, I'm commanding all of you to go and make disciples of all nations. Let's look at, look at what a commission is. A commission is an instruction, a command, or duty given to a person or a group of people. So if you're here in church today, maybe you're new to church, or maybe you've been in church for a while, and you've tried to figure out what is my part to play, what can I do? I want you to understand something. You are called. You're called by God to make disciples and you've been given everything that you need to do everything that God has called you to do. It just simply it takes you embracing the calling that God has on your life. We see the, the famous British missionary Hudson Taylor who helped open the door to reaching China. He said it like this, that the Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. So we get it. We're called. We've been called by God to go and do this thing. But we don't stop, stop there. We don't just take this internal thing of like, all right, I, I'm called. No, we go a little bit further. And, and we see in Romans 10, 14, 
He says, and how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So not only to live on mission are you called, but the thing you need to understand, number two in your notes, is that I have something to say. I have something to say. Some of you may be like, okay, I was on, on board with this whole being called thing, but now we have to go preach? Like I, I, and we read this and it becomes a stumbling block for us, but I think it's important for us to go back and look at the original Greek language that Paul wrote with to see what was the meaning of this word preach that he used here. And the original Greek word here is this word kariso. I don't know if I'm saying that right, but it sounds cool. <laughs> this word kariso, and it means this. It means to make an official announcement or to announce or to make something known. You see, we've churched this word up because of how Paul uses it and uses it as the word preach. But what this used to be was a person who walked down the streets and just made announcements to people. They would say something loudly so everyone around them understood what they were talking about. See, they were able to make things known. And if you, if you read this and you read the word preach, it could be something where we're like, I don't know that I want to do this. Like, do I have to get up on stage with the bright lights and a microphone and come up with some jokes and some, some verses for people? That is not what we're talking about here. But I believe that you do have something to say and there's things that you have that you can make known to other people. So what is it? What is the things that we have to say? What can we make known to other people? Well, I think there's two major things that we can do. And the first one that we can make known to other people is the gospel. We can make the gospel known. And if you're, if you're in foundations this semester, you know that two weeks ago, we just heard an incredible teaching from Dr. Doug where he, he taught about what the, great, uh, what, uh, the gospel is. And I, you know, a lot of what I'm about to teach you are things that I've learned from Dr. Doug over the last couple of years as far as what the gospel is. But the thing is, we don't want just the people in foundations to know what the gospel is. We want everyone watching here today, everyone who will watch this afterwards, that you need to know what the gospel is. And with that being said, if you're not in foundations, I want to encourage you. Spring semester is coming up at the beginning of the year. Sign up. Grow in your knowledge and your relationship with the Lord. You're, you'll be changed forever. But everyone here today, I want us to understand what is the gospel, this thing that we have that we can share with other people. And you, the thing that's interesting about the gospel in, in, in Christianity is that if I had walked through any lobby at any campus today and I asked 50 people to tell me what is the gospel I would probably get 50 different answers. If I asked you, what is the gospel? Maybe you say that Jesus died for our sins. It's like, okay, that's true, right? Or that, that God loved us and he sent his son for us. Also accurate, right? You may get the, that our sins have been forgiven because of Jesus. And the thing is, if I asked 50 different people, I'd probably get 50 different answers. But if we've been called by God to reach people and we have the gospel to share, I think we should probably have some unity in what we're sharing with other people. We don't want to be a house divided against itself. And it's like, well, I heard that person said this and this person said this. No, no, no. I want us to have unity in what we're saying to other people because other religions around the world, they have this thing down. If you asked any Muslim around the world, what do you believe in? They would instantly recite to you the Shahada. And the Shahada says that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. You ask them, they have unity in what they say. So I believe that we need to have unity in what we're gonna to say to other people. But I think one of the barriers sometimes in what we're sharing with others and why we have these different opinions is because we're looking at different Bible verses and pulling things out. And, you know, and when I asked people at Foundations recently, what's the thing that keeps you from sharing the gospel with other people? And one of the primary answers we got was, you know what, I just don't, I don't know enough of the Bible. I don't know enough about Jesus. I don't know enough scriptures. I haven't memorized enough of the Bible. So I don't think I'm qualified to share because I don't know the Bible. And I think that's true, right? Uh, I, I'm a pastor here at the church. I can quote to you, you know, some scripture, but I also know that I can quote to you about 75% of the musical Hamilton, uh, like right off the top. And, and Pastor Matt, a couple of weeks ago when he preached, I know he sang for you guys. I thought about just rapping some Hamilton for you today, but we don't have time, okay? We, we don't have time. But the, the truth is that we spend so much of our time sp like studying and memorizing things that in the end have no uh, uh, authority or weight here on earth. But, but you know, if I have the opportunity to share the gospel with somebody else, I'm not going to throw away my shot. Hamilton reference that like 10 people got. So maybe at another campus, uh, at Brandon, I'm sure they got more of that, that reference there. But, but the truth is we need to have unity in what we're saying. And, and I don't want to overwhelm you with a lot of different verses today that, uh, that we're going to study. We're going to look at one set of verses here. 
And I think this is where we get a very clear picture of what the gospel is. And so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he says, now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached. Now, if he's having to remind them, that means that they heard this in the past, but they had forgotten about it. So he says, listen, I'm going to write you this letter because I want to remind you of the, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and of which you've taken your stand. You've made a decision to follow Jesus because of this gospel. So I'm going to remind you again what it is. He said, it's by this gospel that you're saved and you hold firmly to the word that I preached to you. Otherwise, you would have believed in vain. For what I received, I pass on to you as first importance. So listen, guys, what I've received as the gospel here, I want to pass on to you today as a first importance for your life. Not Hamilton quotes. No, no, this is the thing that you need to, if you don't remember anything else today, you're going to remember this from 1 Corinthians 15. He says that for what I received, I pass on to you as first importance. Here it is, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried and he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was, then he appeared to Cephas and then to the 12. So what is the gospel? What is this message that we can share with other people that we can have unity in what we're saying? Well, it's simply this. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins and was raised on the third day. Christ died for our sins and was raised on the third day. That's the gospel. We have something to say. And we've been called to be ambassadors of Jesus. And so we go and we have a simple message for people. We find it in 1 Corinthians 15. Christ died for our sins and was raised again on the third day. But even if you have an opportunity to share with somebody and you don't remember what I just said, you don't remember the verses. You were like, how, was it, did Jesus die for our sins? Was it Christ? And maybe you even forget that. You get tongue-tied there. You still have something else to say. If you can't tell people about who God is necessarily based on Scripture, I want you to know there's still something else you have to say, and it's simply your testimony. And your testimony is your story of what God has done in your life. I may not be able to quote a lot of scripture to people. I may not be able to tell everybody the attributes of God, but I can tell people about what God has done in my life. You see, as we've sent out short-term missions teams for the last several years, we've done this exercise with them where we teach them about what is the gospel and how do we share that, what we just did. But the second thing is that we share with people about how to share your story. And it amazes me every year that we do this when people say, you know what, I've never thought about this before. I've never thought about, and, and I, I for sure, I've never told anybody this story before. No, 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 we need to be able to be ready with an answer to people. When people say, why are you different? Like, what, what, it, what, what is it about you that's different than everybody else? We need to be ready with an answer. We see that in 1 Peter. It says, in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. We need to be ready to give an answer about what God has done in our lives. You see, I remember being in Michigan several years ago when I was a recruiter up there and I was in Lansing and we were at our, at our church kind of gathering of leadership and we were talking about this thing right here, about sharing our story with others. I remember there was this guy, Juan, who kind of stopped us. He goes, you want me to do what? Like, you want me to go to my friends that I've grown up with and you want me to tell them about Jesus? It's like, y y do you know what they've seen me do? They've seen me at my worst. They've seen me when I was drunk. They've seen me when I was high. They've seen me do all these crazy things. And you want me to tell them about Jesus? And we instantly begin to disqualify ourselves from sharing who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in our life with other people. And I remember stopping him and I said, okay, so you have a past, right? This is who you were. And they know that. He said, yeah, they, they know that very clearly. I said, but you've changed, right? And you're, you're different now. And he said, yeah. And I said, and they know that. He said, yeah. I said, what an incredible opportunity to fill in that gap. How did you go from here to here? And the answer is Jesus. See, we need to be able to tell people about, listen, I, I know you know who I was, but I'm not that person anymore. And there's one answer for why I'm not that person anymore. And it's because of what Jesus has done in my life. You see, there is a power to your story that maybe you don't understand. Because people may not always be able to re relate with scripture, but they can relate to your story. And your story may not impact everybody, but it can impact somebody. Because there's somebody who's been through something that you've been through that you can share what God has brought you through. There's a power in your testimony. We see this in Revelation 12, when the apostle John is writing about how Satan will be defeated in the last days. In Revelation 12, he says that they triumphed over him, Satan, by the blood of the lamb, that's the gospel, and the word of their testimony. So I wanna encourage you, if you've never taken time to write down your story of what God has done in your life, take some time today or maybe this week, to write out your testimony. And here's, here's a simple structure for your testimony. It starts with 
my life before Christ. Here's who I was. Then it goes into how I came to Christ. This is that kind of conversion moment that I had where I came to know who Jesus is. And then you get to share the best part. Now my life with Christ. Here's how my life started. But man, here's how my life is going now. And you can share that with other people. And there's a power to what you have to say. So we, we, we're living on mission. We understand that I am called. I have something to say. I can share the gospel. I can share my testimony with other people. But what we've been talking about so far, so far is all about us. It's me. I, I'm called. I have something to say. But Paul doesn't end there because look what he says. Romans 10, 14. How can they call on the one of whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? So we understand it's not about me anymore. I, okay, I have an understanding that I'm called and I have something to say, but number three is maybe the, the most important part of this is that others need to hear. Yeah, right. Others need to hear this thing that we have, this, the, the gospel that we have to share, the testimony of what God is in our lives. Other people need to hear about this. And the thing is, like we heard the stats earlier. We understand people need to hear about this. We're on the decline in Christianity in our country and in, and in our state. And the thing is, you know, we, we need to, to see the country change, but I also am, am at a place where I understand something. That although I want to see the United States change, I can't change the United States. I can't do it by myself. Like, I, I want to see the state of Florida reach. I'm a sixth-generation Floridian. I love Florida. Go Knowles. And um, I, I want to see Florida reach, but I can't, I can't save Florida. I want to see Tampa Bay change. I want to see that statistic change. I want us to beat Las Vegas as far as number of regular churchgoers that we have. I want to see Tampa Bay reach. And that's why we're going to continue to launch locations. I'm so excited for West Chase coming in January because we've said it all the time. For the local church to be effective, it needs to be local. And I want to see us continue to expand and reach more people. And as much as I have a heart for Tampa Bay, I can't save Tampa Bay. And I think it's the difference here. Of, of our focus. When our focus is really broad, it's harder to make a greater impact than if we have a, a focus, uh, a really more intentional focus of what we're doing. It reminds me of the difference between a light bulb and a laser. And I, I didn't know any, I, this is great Google work. I actually was on NASA's website reading about lasers the other day. I felt like a huge nerd. So, uh, But there's a big difference between a, a light bulb and a laser. They both emit light, but they do it very differently. A light bulb puts off light, but it has many different wavelengths you can see there, and, and it's multi-directional and, and it's incoherent, right? But a laser puts off light very differently. The light is monochromatic. I didn't know what that meant. I had to Google that word. And uh, <clears throat> it means that it has one wavelength, but a laser is, has one wavelength, it's directional, and it's coherent. See, there's a big difference here. A light bulb puts off a lot of light and that light's able to touch a lot of different things, but it, the light from a light bulb doesn't impact anything that it touches, just simply it touches it. But a laser, however, when it's focused, especially when you have an ultra concentrated laser, it has enough power to cut through steel. And what's the difference between the two? It's focus. And that's what we need to have as believers. We need to have a focus where it's like, I can't reach everyone. I want you to write this in your notes right here. I think this is maybe one of the most important things you'll hear today is that I can't reach everyone but I can reach someone. I can't reach the United States. I can't reach the state of Florida. I can't reach Tampa Bay, but I can reach the people that God has placed in my life. The people that God has placed a burden on my heart for, I can reach them. So earlier we talked about how will they call on the one of whom they have not heard. I want you, I want you to answer this in your notes today. For you, who are they? Who are they for you? There's, you have blanks there. There's no correct answer. This is for you. This is for people that you have in your life that if you were able to focus in, maybe you could reach these people right here. And when you think about who they are, I want you to think about the fact that you, the, the knowledge that they don't have a relationship with God right now, it, it hurts your heart. The fact that you understand that right now that they're, they're separated from God for eternity and you just can't accept the, the fact that that person doesn't know God. And I want, I want us to think together as a church, if we were able to focus, if we were able to live on mission and be able to not reach everyone, but reach somebody, think of what we could do, the, the impact that we could make across all of our locations today at Radiant. There's gonna be about 5,000 people here. Think about today, if we had 5,000 people at Radiant Church all reach one person, think of the impact. 
Think of how we can change the numbers. If all of us reach two, we're reaching thousands and thousands of people. But what does it take? It takes us living on mission. It takes us not being okay with the statistics and the way the trends go. It takes us getting out of our comfort zone and saying, you know what? I, I don't care what people think of me. I don't care what people say. They need to hear the news that I have to say. I have the gospel. I have the good news of Jesus. Let's stand to our feet across all locations. I have good news that they need to hear. I have a story of what God said in my life. And I need to get out of my own way and say, God, here I am. I'm available for you. Would you use me in incredible ways? You are called by God. You have something to say. Now get out of your own way. Make yourself available to God. So I want us to sing this out together. And let's make this a declaration for our lives today. see us be a church that lives on mission that's intentional about reaching people for Jesus and not being okay with how things are going but we want to see a change and it starts with us living out the calling that we have the things that we have to say to those who need to hear it but I believe there's also a group of people in the room today who maybe you're here today we've been talking a lot about as Christians this is our responsibility to go and reach others but maybe you're here today and you've never made a decision for Jesus yet I want you to know you're in the right place I want you to know if you're here, you're not here by mistake and you're probably on one of these lists of, of a day that somebody's been praying for. And I, and I don't think you're here by mistake. I believe that God has brought you here for a specific reason today. And it, what, an, what an amazing day to be here so that you get to hear today, maybe for the first time that Christ died for your sins and was raised again on the third day. See, as we go throughout the book of Romans, Paul writes a lot about Jesus and he says in there that, that the wages of sin is death. Listen, we all have a past. We all have, we all deserve punishment for the things that we've done. And the Bible says that, that the wages of sin is death, but it doesn't stop there. It says, but the free gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus. You see in Romans 10, we also see that if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, that you can be saved. And I believe that there's people here today across all of our locations that maybe God's been stirring in your heart. Maybe that, that faith has been built up in your heart as we've been going. I think now is that time for you to make that de declaration that Jesus is Lord. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, here in South Tampa, across all of our locations, if that's you today, and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I wanna give you right now an opportunity to make a simple yet significant decision to say yes to Jesus. So if that's you here today, across all of vacations. When I count to three, I don't want you to do anything. We're not gonna make you come forward. We're not gonna make you do anything. All I want you to simply do is when I count to three, raise your hand, wave it at me, and you can put it right back down. So if that's you, you're ready to receive Jesus today on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see that hand. Wave it at me. I see your hand there. Yep, I see, I see it. Brandon, Heights, North Tampa, I see those hands there. Thank you for making an incredible decision. And we had, we had a lot of people here raise their hand, and, and we're all gonna pray this prayer together. There's nothing special about this prayer we're gonna do together but it is an opportunity for us to declare about Jesus being our Lord today. So let's pray this out together. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Today I choose to live for you. Would you be my Lord and would you be my savior? And it's in Jesus name we pray and everyone said, hey, can we get it for the hands all across South Tampa, all of our locations, the people who just made that decision here today.